Hey, what is up everyone? Today we're gonna to talk about how to improve doctor and patient relations through narrative medicine. A way to train doctors to use the arts, the arts to communicate and strengthen relationships between doctors and patients in order to provide better diagnosis and treatment. I'm Risa Morimoto, your host, and you're watching Modern Aging, where we chat about innovative and holistic ways to care for one another as we age. If you want to stay in the loop about all our latest videos, be sure to click on that subscribe button and that little bell so you'll always be sure to be notified when new episodes are uploaded. Today's guest is Dr. Beth Hoosey. She's an academic hospitalist at Norwalk Community Hospital, where she teaches residents and students narrative medicine. She received her medical degree from Columbia University and then did a residency at Yale. I think after you watch this interview, you'll either want a doctor who is trained in narrative medicine or you're gonna hopefully learn some tools so that you can better communicate with your doctor. Check it out. Super excited to talk to you today. Um, so before we kind of get into the nitty gritty, can you tell me a little bit about yourself, how you came to be a doctor? Absolutely. So right now I'm a teaching hospitalist at Norwalk Hospital in Connecticut. And that means that I'm a doctor who works only in the hospital as a general internist of sorts. And the teaching aspect for me is that I work with residents and students all the time. Physicianhood was not my first career. I actually worked in children's book publishing right after college. So I've always been someone who loves the arts and English. But I realized that I missed science and that might not be challenging decades down the road. So I went to medical school and I happened to land in places that really valued the humanities and the arts. So now when I do my teaching, part of my practice is to teach something called narrative medicine. Tell me what is narrative medicine and sure. how, did you know about narrative medicine before you actually went into med school? I did not, I did not. And the reason I know about it is because I happened to go to Columbia for medical school where Dr. Rita Sharon is and she's the person who founded the field in a sense. So she gave a TED talk in which she described narrative medicine as clinical practice fortified by the knowledge of what to do with stories. Wow. So, mm -hmm. so, so, <laughs> so what does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> There's a famous physician named Sir William Osler. He was one of the founders of Johns Hopkins Hospital. He's had many wise sayings, pithy sayings that we all learn. And one of them was, listen to the patient. He is telling you the diagnosis. Wow. And that's a way of trying to teach us to take a very good history. And it sounds straightforward, but it is not straightforward at all. Because when you meet a patient, it's not usually a linear sequence of this symptom started then, then it got worse, then a new symptom happened, and it all lines up perfectly with the physical exam and the labs and the CAT scan and what other people say to give you a diagnosis. It's hard to get a really good history because people tell you things out of order, uh -huh. don't remember, I would certainly be a culprit of that. Wives usually have very, very different accounts of what happened than husbands do. Um, a person's culture can influence how they feel symptoms and what they might report to a doctor or another clinician. If a person has a bunch of people with them or not, that can be very telling. What people don't say, what they leave out, perhaps well, intentionally right. or are afraid to say can be telling. And then the physical exam can also tell you something different, perhaps about how long something's been going on, a certain symptom. Is that part of narrative medicine where you're trained to kind of look at all those other things in yes. a different way, I guess? We think that using art to hone our observation skills can help you do all of those things and gather all that information into one coherent story. Wow. I think that that's what she means about knowing what to do with stories, that taking all that, what, what can be contradictory information together, and then doing something about it. It's a big focus on the actual practicing of effective health care. So how would you say that's different from like traditional med school and mm -hmm. the way mm -hmm. someone is taught to treat or to diagnose? Or? It's always, for the longest time, it's largely, and this is changing, but it's largely been lectures where you have one learned professor 
telling you this, you read from books, you learn facts, you learn lists, you learn a different language, which is, I think, part of the reason it's actually hard for doctors to take great histories because now our brains are in a different language right. that most patients don't speak. Um, so you learn an organized way of thinking about diseases, but that's not how most people speak and talk. Right. <laughs> so you're kind of coming from two different viewpoints to begin with. So there has been a shift to more practice-based learning, to learning in groups and having a more collegial atmosphere. And over the years, the trend of narrative medicine has reached more places to use art in order to become better. Can you give me an example of, of how you would use, or how you're taught to use art mm -hmm. to then kind of extrapolate and be able to like, then, you know, treat a patient. Definitely, and, definitely. And apply it to medicine. Right, right. Well, one of the big tenets of narrative medicine is something called close reading. And you can use the word reading loosely because you can use literature, an excerpt from a book, or a painting, or a picture, a photograph, or even music, which I haven't had the cojones to do myself yet. <laughs> um, but for exa example, with my residents, we used a painting called Dans un Café by Degas. And it's an image of a woman and a man sitting in a bar after a long night. The night has come and gone, and the sun is rising. And there's a cup of absinthe in front of the woman. And she looks to me pretty forlorn and down. But I don't tell them any of the background. And I sit with my residents in internal medicine. We look at it, and we try and start with objective data. What color is her face? What shape is her mouth? Um, where's the light coming from? And try and be very strict about not interpreting anything, which is how doctors should be when approaching a new patient. Wow. Because, yeah. you know, there might be symptoms that don't go with what you're thinking it could be, and you have to consider that and revise what your diagnosis might be. And make that when making your, what we call a differential diagnosis of what could be going on. Anchoring is a big problem sometimes in medicine, and that's a What's term. Anchoring? It's a term for seeing you, seeing you have swelling in your ankles, and me saying, "Oh, I know that's heart failure," you know, without gathering enough information. Right. It could be something else. Um, so you don't. So you're want saying to, that doctors tend to like kind of jump yeah, to that conclusion yeah. before they should. I think it's human nature, right. and actually the more experienced you are as a doctor, the, the riskier it is. Students are very good because they don't have enough experience under their belt to right. have seen many cases, so they're better at really looking at objective data. And we try and treat the painting as a piece of objective data, and then finally I let the residents talk about what do they think could be going on, what's the interpretation of this painting. Wow. That's awesome. So I assume you did that as a student. I did that to an extent as a student. When I was at Columbia, I did have a class with Dr. Sharon. Uh, at that time, it was mostly literature and writing. So another component of the, the course is writing to a prompt. We call it in the shadow of the text. So we all talk about a piece of art. We'll get, use that painting as an example. And then I give the residents a prompt, a very vague, short statement. And for this painting, it might be about a time you were up all night. And I give them five minutes to write, and they, every person writes something that springs to mind when they hear that prompt, and then some of us share wow. our writing, which can be pretty intimidating. Wow. And so how do you think that's affected you as a doctor? I think it has made me slow down and really give patients the ability to tell me in their own words without me interrupting them with a list of questions I have in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. um, the sequence, because you can glean the sequence if you listen long enough. And I think it's helped me get better at the physical exam because I'm paying more attention to the hue of a rash or exactly how swollen someone might be, paying attention to the details. Wow. And that's just 
from studying art, which is amazing because yeah. that, it's not a logical connection, right? When people right. think about right. studying, it's not. you know, going to med school. It's true. Um, it's true. So how do you think patients benefit by having a doctor who's sensitive to that sort of thing? It's all about listening closely. It's, and the thought is that that training enables you to be a better listener to oral stories. And who, um, if you think about who you would like as a doctor, it would be someone who listens to you carefully and really takes it in and invests that time and mental ener energy into that communication. So I think patients realize that doctor cares for you if they're really listening closely. And that's mutually beneficial, even if there's no cure to be had for a particular disease, to feel heard and to be able to give words to what's really a chaotic, disturbing experience of being ill is therapeutic in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So do you find like that there's a trend towards this? I mean, it's weird because I listen to you and I think that it's so amazing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so logical, right. yet I feel like the reality of medicine right now is mm -hmm. so hurried. Right, and everything is just like, you know, yes. you've got to get you know, as many yes. patients in as possible per day, yes. which of course is completely contradictory to listening. Right. Um, so I'm just wondering from your experience as a doctor, mm -hmm. how, I don't know if because you're a hospitalist, is mm -hmm. that make it easier for you as opposed to being a, you know, PCP and, or something? Right, I'm glad you asked that. That's a big elephant in the room in a way. Uh, I find it easier to be a hospitalist. I like to say that the patients are my hostages because I can always go back and ask them more questions and I do have more time than a typical generalist and the outpatient setting does. Um, but it's, it has become more known as a field but at the same time, like you mentioned, there's all this financial pressure and other pressure to have patients be seen very quickly and it doesn't really coincide. But I think it's absolutely necessary to use narrative medicine for both the patient's sake and the doctor's sake and other clinicians' sake as an antidote to burnout. Because with all that pressure, with all this time, crunch and pages and text messages and EMRs, physicians are getting burnt out and that's detrimental to everyone. So I think it's a way to restore some of the humanity, some of what makes it fun mm -hmm. to be a doctor. And it doesn't take that much time to sit and let a patient tell you what's really bothering him or her and to really show that you're listening. Right. Are there some specific questions that you ask mm -hmm. that are, I don't know, whether it's open-ended questions mm -hmm. or whatever, to try to elicit certain kinds of responses? Open-ended questions are always perfect to start with. should always do that. Um, sometimes if it's a very serious illness or topic, I'll ask, what are you feel fearful of? If someone we know perhaps is going to die from a cancer, I'll ask, what is important to you for the rest of your life? What do you want to be doing? And I stole that from being mortal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so heavy questions that doctors are privileged to be able to ask and open-ended questions can be very revealing. I feel like that maybe, you know, um, that families can apply this as well mm -hmm. if they feel like you know, mm -hmm. mom or dad is not quite the same. Right, mm -hmm. there's something going on, mm -hmm. but maybe you know, it might be awkward to just ask what's wrong type of thing. Okay. I mean, you know, before they kind of right. go to the doctor. Okay. Are there things that you think that that families could do to initiate these kind of discussions or you know conversations if they go to a doctor who not necessarily practices mm -hmm. narrative medicine, they can right. kind of help right. fill in some of the gaps or some of the holes. I don't know. I'm just, That's an as I'm listening, question. I'm yeah. listening to you, I'm trying to figure out how do we expand this, right? And right. how do we, right. the more players, I don't know. But then again, you know, stories always have perspective. That's part of the problem sometimes, right? Right. But that's part of why it's fun to use art because art is not as, um, doesn't make you feel as vulnerable. And you can notice that many different people have many different reactions to the same painting mm -hmm. and feel very strongly about it. And you realize, hey, I don't share that 
vision, but I can see where you're coming from. So perspective is one great thing about the art. But to answer your question, which I think is an excellent question, I think I would, something we're trained sometimes to do is just comment and say, hey, you, you haven't really been acting completely yourself. Can you tell me about that? Or have you also noticed that? You know, what do you think might be behind that? It might be a little trickier for families uh -huh. coming from more um, baggage, so to speak, and easier for someone like me. But just comments and silence can actually go a long way. I would love to say it's common, but I am mm. not so optimistic. <laughs> right. I think it's getting more common. I think it's getting more traction. There are blogs. There are online magazines surrounding this field. Um, more and more residencies and schools are taking it up as another part of the curriculum. And I am hopeful that it will continue to expand, and I think it will, because some of the leaders in the field really are so proactive and so smart and fun to listen to. Is it more effective for like PCPs or, you know, because there's so many mm -hmm. specialists, right? Right. Um, Right. I think it's perfect for everyone. It can be, students are really great, medical students or any student in the medical field, because they are still civilians of a sort who still have one foot in normal life, but they're also learning the whole medical vocabulary, the whole machine, as it were. And so they're straddling the two worlds. So they have really great perspectives. And then as we get more and more experienced in medicine, it's almost like we become a different culture. Right. Um, but those who are honestly most resistant to this kind of work and say, oh, no, I'm scientifically oriented, I don't need art, can benefit the most from it. Is it this type of thing where you can ask a doctor if they You can ask, sure. If they've studied, I mean, what do you... You can ask. I think most of the time the answer will probably be no oh, right. for now. <laughs> like, what are you but, talking about? <laughs> I mean, is it something that, you know, doctors even know about, that this is a field? Some do, some do. My colleagues all know, right. as an example, and I'm sure everybody at Columbia knows because that's an integral part of their curriculum now. It's required. Um, so many will, but I, I would say the majority will not. Because this is the modern age and because we're talking about people who right. are older, um, they usually have multiple things going on. Right. right? And they've right. also had this life history of yes. things. Yes, yes. Um, how you feel like something like Marin of Medicine can really benefit. I think it, it's perfect for older patients because they did grow up in a different time when there weren't smartphones interrupting thoughts every two seconds. And they love telling their stories for the most part. Almost every older person that I've met would be thrilled to be able to tell you more about their life. So I think it, it really is perfect to form a connection between two generations that may not have that much more in common. If you're someone who will listen attentively to an older person, that's great for, for buy-in and healing. Because even if you're the best diagnostician, if you use the science perfectly and you land on the right diagnosis, if that patient doesn't have a connection with you, a human connection with you, and doesn't realize that you care about him or her, they're not going to take the medicine that you propose. Mm -hmm. The chances of that go down very far. So well, if, is that true? Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. So if you have someone that you connect with and have a conversation, you're much more likely to comply with the treatment. We would love to hear your thoughts, so feel free to leave a note in that comment section below. If you found the video helpful, share it with your friends or family. And be sure to subscribe so that you're always notified when new episodes are uploaded. Feel free to DM me on Instagram or Facebook at This Is Modern Aging. But the best way to keep in the loop is to sign up on our email list at thisismodernaging.com. To live your best life tomorrow, you need to start today. So thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Modern Aging.